All right, so our next speaker is here from Yale. Uh, it's David Rim. He's a professor of pathology and medicine, uh, and he'll be talking today about uh, his work uh, also in the, in the area of, of visualizing tumor immunity. Hey, um, great. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I'm honored to be part of this session. As, as a pathologist, to be um, in a session on immuno-oncology makes me a little nervous, too. But uh, thanks for um, inviting me, and I um, look forward to sharing um, my approach to visualizing tumor immunity in response. Unlike Dr. Wu, um, our resolution isn't in the millimeter range, it's in the micron range. But also unlike Dr. Wu, who gave a beautiful talk, um, I, can't, I can only get one piece. Um, of the tissue. I don't get time courses and I don't get, and, and maybe when we start doing new adjuvant or on, on treatment biopsies, I'll do more than that. But right now, we just get one piece of tissue. So I want to start with my disclosures. These are um, the um, people that fund work in my lab and the people to, with whom I consult. And um, this is kind of a long list, so I don't breeze through it in one second. But I want to share also that these are my partners, because generally what I do in my lab can't become, can't actually help patients unless there are commercialization avenues, and these are some of the avenues for commercialization. Here's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you first about the current assessment of um, to, uh, visual, how we visualize uh, tumor immunity in the clinic today, and that is PDL1 IHC. And I'm going to only talk to you about that briefly. It's uh, actually quite a nightmare, um, but I'll, tell, I'll update you a little bit on where we are with that. And then I want to talk about what are these things called immune cells, um, which are an important part of the visualization and, and actually a criteria for um, response to therapy in uh, breast cancer. And then I'll talk to you about new tools that we have, Hyplex discovery tools, and our approach in, in, in my lab, which is to sort of not start with the immunology and go forward to drugs and, and diagnostics, but rather to start with the, the patient's tumors who have been treated with drugs and then go backwards to try to find effects using Hyplex methods to look for potential diagnostics or mechanisms by which we can enrich the population giving, that we're giving those drugs to. So this is where we stand today. Um, and there are, are a multiple diagnostic tests, all of which are associated with different therapeutics made by different companies. And the therapeutics are shown here, uh, tezolizumab, dervalumab, volumab, and pembrolizumab. And then their status with FDA approval or EMA approval and, and what um, line of therapy and what criteria there are um, for, for making the diagnosis of pdl one positive. And I don't have slides here I'm not going to show. I'm sure my uh, future slides will show that the pdl one positive patients are generally the ones that respond. But how you determine whether patients are pdl one positives are quite a challenge. So this is how, kind of how we read it. Uh, the pathologists actually look at it, and I'll show you some pictures in a minute. But we either call things negative and all drugs like that category. But then what other category you use, what percentage of cells are positive at any intensity, depends on which drug. And the pathologists don't know what drug the oncologist is going to give. So this is a little bit of a problem in, in diagnostics. And we also read in two, in two regions. We read tumor cell staining, and we read this thing called immune cell staining. And, I, and we'll talk a lot about what immune cells are. But it's basically um, lymphocytes, macrophages, or any other cells that are not tumor cells that are in the stroma and not clearly fibroblasts. So here's um, another way that we read. Um, another thing that we have to do for some tests is we call combined proportion score. Where we look at the PDL1 staining cells, including tumor cells, lymphocytes, and macrophages, and then divide it by the total number of viable cells. So how many people think that's accurate? We can't do this, but it is actually FDA approved tests that we're supposed to do as pathologists. So it's a problem that we can sort of estimate things, and pathologists in general don't count every cell. We estimate how many we see. And here's an example. So you think I could count every cell in this slide? Not in a practical way. But what you can see is it's pretty clearly strong tumor cell staining, immunohistochemistry. And also, there's a lot of these cells in the stroma, quote unquote, immune cells. In fact, there's a great, great correlation between immune cells and tumor cells. And these are probably some kind of cell related to the immune response in the microenvironment and not related to whatever alterations are occurring in the tumor. Here's another example of one high power field, and this is uh, probably a 40x field, and you can see 
the, heter the heterogeneity problem. So we only get, as, as was pointed out by Dr. Wu, we only get a little tiny piece of tissue. Sometimes it's so small that it's only a few hundred or a thousand cells. And even in this field of view, which probably has less than a hundred cells, you can see some parts of it are really strong and some parts of it are really weak. So we can talk about percent cells positive, but we don't even look at intensity, how, how light these cells are compared to how dark staining these cells are. And so these are sort of the challenges of scoring PDL1 and, and what we would call them. And then we take cell, and then we, what we actually see are even things like this. So is this tumor cell staining or is immune cell staining? It's a little bit of a challenge. In fact, probably if you ask 10 pathologists, they wouldn't all agree. But I would argue that what we see here is actually tumor, uh, immune cells or macrophages surrounding the tumor cells and that this is actually immune cell staining, not tumor cell staining in this particular case. There might not be any real tumor cell staining or maybe a small percentage of tumor cell staining, even though cases like this are fairly common and easily could be confused. So this is kind of where we are um, with the diagnosis along with the fact that we have four different diagnostic tests, one that's clearly inferior to the other three in terms of its sensitivity of detection. So with this in mind, what we really need to do is come up with something new. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So to summarize where we are, there's been only two statistically powered studies in, in lung cancer that looked at, uh, and a number, probably 40 or 50 smaller studies, that looked at these tests. And what we find is that all the FDA, these three FDA approved tests and this lab derived test, which is what we actually do here at Yale, are um, practically equivalent, whereas this test is lower um, sensitivity for both tumor cells and immune cells. Pathologists can actually read tumor cells. We have good concordance in reading the tumor cells, but our concordance in reading immune cells is worse than a coin flip. Um, and CPS has not been tested at outside of vendor site tests, but seems to, uh, and in fact pa failed for CPS 20 but it's unlikely to be better than immune cell scoring. So um, with that in mind, what are immune cells and can we find out some, some more um, visual, can we look at some visual observations to um, come up with ultimately a better way of predicting responders to therapy? And so here's the, here's the way we score and you can see that here's the, again, this is another summary from um, the FDA branch chief on com companion diagnostics or complementary diagnostics and the drugs and then the scoring. And you can see that for lung cancer, where we started out, there's tumor proportion score or tumor cell scoring. But then you can see all the rest of them have some component, or many of the rest of them have some component either of immune scales or CPS scores, which are suggesting that the immune cells are probably really important. So what's going on there? Well, if you look in the basic science literature, I'm not going to go in detail through these papers. Both of these papers showed that it was the PDL1 in the macrophages, not in the tumor cells. That gave, that gave sensitivity to PD-1 pathway inhibition. And here, for example, they show that uh, in patients with wild-type macrophages and PD-1 knockout mice, um, they did see a response. That's by transferring in wild-type macrophages, whereas if PD-1 negative macrophages, that uh, knocked out macrophages um, in PD-1 positive or PD-1 negative mice, no response. So that the macrophages are what was generating the response, not the tumor. And this study is similar. I won't go into details, but basically putting in PDL1 positive tumors and PDL1 uh, knocked out or negative macrophages result in a lack of response. So with that in mind, maybe we should actually try to figure out what those immune cells are. This would suggest maybe they're macrophages. And I would argue that I, even though I'm uh, a reasonable pathologist, I can't tell you what those two cells with the stars are. Are they macrophages or are they tumor cells? Well, they kind of look like tumor cells, and they're clearly expressing PDL1. Maybe that one's a macrophage. How do I know? Well, fortunately, in the science world, not in the diagnostic world, but in the science world, we have ways of telling those apart by simply staining with CD68. So here's a slide very similar to the one Marcus Bosenberg showed in Grand Rounds in Pathology yesterday, where we see the H and E of a melanoma, and then the PDL1 staining of the melanoma. So is this macrophage staining, or is it tumor cell staining? I would argue there's no way we can tell. And in fact, but, but if we stain with CD68, we can see a huge number of macrophages. The macrophages are yellow in this side and white in this lung cancer section, seeing that a lot of what we're seeing is probably macrophages, not tumor cell staining. And in fact, it may be that macrophage staining hiding under the tumor cells, it's what really the diagnostic tool that's guiding us on which patients will respond to therapy. So let's go to confocal microscopy. We can take a little closer look at what's going on. 
And here in this, in this image of this, uh, of this lung cancer case, you can see the multiplex fluorescence, and here's the DAB. So that's the cell we're going to look at right there. Okay? And so if you take that cell, and then you look at it on confocal, you can uh, dissect it apart, and you can see that the cell's positive for pdl one along with a bunch of other cells, but it's also positive for CD68 and negative for cytokeratin. So that means it's a macrophage that's staining. Now, that's not to say there aren't a lot of tumor cells staining with pdl one too, but I think this is an important example. Here's another example using confocal microscopy at high power. You can see this little region here, and here's this sheet of tumor cells, but here's a sort of an infiltrating macrophage, and that's what's staining with pdl one In fact, the rest of this case isn't pdl one positive, but the macrophage is pdl one positive. So let's count them. That's what we do in my lab. We always count stuff up and measure stuff. And so we have actually a tool that what we're going to do is look at the target positive cells divided by the total cells. And we're going to do that in the regions of tumor, in the regions of stroma. And then a double positive cell will be positive for cytokeratin and PDL1. And that's going to be a tumor cell positive. And if it's CD68 positive and PDL1 positive, we'll call that a positive macrophage. I know there's other things that are positive for CD68, but I would argue that that just for the sake of ease, we'll just call that macrophages, even though it's really CD68 positive. Then we'll look at CD8 double positives with PDL1 and CD56 and as a surrogate for NK cells. So how do they come out? So here's an example of some different cases, and you can see what the case looked like here, and then quantifying the number of cells in this field of view that are positive for cytokeratin and PDL1. These are all positive for PDL1. So they all have some PDL1 present in them. And then the bar shows where it is. So here you can see it's a lot of CK, but a little bit in the macrophage. And in the stroma, it's essentially all in the macrophage. Here's a case where everything is in the macrophages. Here's a case where in the tumor, it's in the cytokeratin positive, And in the stroma, it's in the macrophages. And here's a case where there's no CD8 or no PDL1 in, in the macrophage compartment, but it's all in the tumor compartment, except for this little tiny bit here. And the other thing you notice is in all the cases, there's very little staining with CD56 or CD8. So most of the immune cell staining seems to be with macrophages. And if you look at 126 different lung cancer cases, you can summarize them like this. This is the distribution in the tumor. And you can see that the PDL1 in the tumor is 41% in macrophages. And that's what Marcus was showing yesterday as well, that it's, even though it looks like it's in the tumor cells, it's really there's a bunch of macrophages that we can't morphologically distinguish from tumor cells that are probably bearing a lot of the PDL1 expression. And that, although there is a lot in tumor cells as well, and I don't want to diminish that because that combination may well be important. Whereas in the stroma, it's essentially all in the macrophages. There's about 10 or 12 percent that's in tumor cells or epithelial or CK positive cells in the stroma, which might be individual tumor cells. And then there's little tiny bits in CD8 or CD56 compartments. So in summary, the immune cell expression is more predictive in, tu in, uh, in, in than in tumor cells in some cancers. In fact, gastric, cervical, and bladder, head and neck, and breast. We don't even look for tumor cell staining. We're just looking for immune cell staining to predict response to therapy, except for the CPS, which kind of combines it in there in some non-reproducible way. In mouse models, anti pdl one mediated therapies only work when the host can express pdl one in the macrophages independent of tumor cell expression. And finally, our data that I just showed you said that pdl one is expression is high in macrophages. So that leads to this hypothesis that we're going to try to test in patients. pd one expression in macrophages carries the predictive power of the biomarker. So what I really should get is a keynote trial or a checkmate trial. But I can't get those. I'm an academic investigator. So what we have to do is retrospectively collect a bunch of patients that have been treated here by Roy and Scott and Sarah with atezolizumab, nivolumab, or pembrolizumab in the metastatic setting here at Yale. Uh, where we have the tissue biopsy from their pretreatment specimen. And you can see, unfortunately, there's only 67 patients that had monotherapy, including only 62 with a pretreatment biopsy. So it's a little bit, maybe an order of magnitude, smaller than the keynote or check, checkmate studies, but at least it can give us a little bit of pilot information about what, and, and we can measure every cell in these, in these patients, and maybe this pilot information can point us in the direction of the importance of PDL1 in macrophages versus tumor cells. And here it is. Here's PDL1 in the tumor cells, measured the same way I showed you before. And in fact, PDL1 in the tumor cells in this cohort is not associated with outcome, whereas PDL1 in the macrophages is statistically significantly associated with outcome, suggesting that it might actually be the PDL1 in the macrophages.
So how does the model work? Here's a model. This is a little bit pie in the sky, and excuse the um, pathologist approach to immunology here. But what you can see is that um, the, the general canonical mechanism, if you will, is that when PD-1 interrupts the PDL one or when the antibody, uh, either an anti-PD-1 or an anti-PDL one, interrupts this interaction, then that inactivates uh, the checkpoint, and then the T cell can kill the tumor cell. And so that's clearly one approach, and that's what, we, what I learned, and I think we all learned, is the potential mechanism of action of these checkpoint inhibitors. Well, I'd like to propose an alternative approach based on the data that I just showed you, which I show you here. That maybe what happens is that macrophages are the controllers of inflammation in the tumor. And then, in fact, the macrophages are moderating the level of, of, of inflammation by their interaction with PD-1 on the T cells. And when, they, when the macrophages, quote unquote, see the T cell present by binding from PD-1 to PD-L1, then they don't have to produce any more T cells or bring any more T cells to the site of inflammation. But when, the mac when you inhibit that interaction with an antibody, then the macrophage thinks there's not enough T cells around, even though there are. And so it upregulates perhaps CXCL9 and CXCL10. I don't know that, we're, we're doing that right now. But that would be a way to make the tumor hot. And in fact, that's what Dr. Wu just showed, that after you treat with PDL1, you increase the inflammation, um, you increase the number of T cells that go to the site. And so this, I would posit, is an alternative mechanism of action for PDL1 and maybe how, um, how we're seeing some of the mechanism of PDL1. In fact, this might be a better mechanism to predict response to therapy than just looking at IHC for, P, for PDL1 using uh, tumor cell staining. So, um, and at conclusions, we, I, I have other support. This actually, uh, this paper just got accepted in clinical cancer research. You can read the details. We had other supporting mechanisms as well, looking at other methods or other assay conditions, and then a third method um, called nanostring digital spatial profiling, which all support this data. And I'll show you a little bit of that next, because what I want to talk about next is, is HyPlex discovery tools. That is. Okay, if we found this, you know, we kind of came at this one from the clinical side and then we found the importance of macrophages. But now I'd like to talk about tools that we can use, especially new tools, to visualize tumor immunity because that's what that's sort of the context is, are, what are the other ways of visualizing tumor immunity? So first I'm going to talk to you about digital spatial profiling and then I'm going to talk about imaging mass cytometry. And I'm going to assume that some of you in the audience, maybe many of you, don't know what these tools are. So I'll explain them a little bit and then show you a little bit about discoveries we've made so far, which are completely pilot level to study, studies and need to be validated, but open our eyes as to new potential biomarkers that may be better than PDL1 IHC in determining which patients are likely to respond to immune therapy. So this is the nanostring digital spatial profiling um, mechanism, and this is the nanostring DNA tag that binds to a barcode so that we can count exactly how many DNA tags we have in a solution. And we can also hook them up to an antibody through a photocleavable linker. So here's the tag, and then here's the antibody with a photocleavable linker. And so that we can take that antibody with the photocleavable linker on it and put it right on a slide, just like immunohistochemistry, but we can do 44 or 800 at once. Um, our experiments, we've only done 44, but the theoretical limit is actually thousands because instead of um, detecting them, you can sequence them. But either way, you have to put them within compartments. We're not making the immunohistochemistry I showed you is at about 0.5 micron resolution. This technology is at 10 micron resolution. So we're not going to be able to make an image. We can make a heat map, but we're not going to be able to make an image. But what we can do is define the image and define regions of, the in, of interest in the image with immunohistochemistry or immunofluorescence rather, and then point that laser at those immunofluorescent positive regions and cleave off that tag, and then sip it up with a little sipper and put it in a, in a, four, in a 96 well plate and then count it where this machine where we hybridize a counting device and then count. So we're counting every single one of these, um, of these tags. So it's a way of quantitatively looking at multiple antibodies at one time all in one section of tumor. And so to do this, um, we're going to use a cohort of melanoma patients all treated with immunotherapy collected by Harriet Kluger uh, and Pak Fei Wong and, as a grad student in my lab. And again, not a clinical trial, but a pretty respectable collection of retrospectively treated patients with PEMRO, NEVO, or IPI-NEVO, as many as 117, or we're going to use a TMA. So, so in order to make a TMA, they had to be bigger tumors. These are all pretreatment treatment 
uh, biopsies, and so they had to be bigger tumors. But we have 60 of those that were large enough to biopsy and make TMAs, of which we could make four master blocks, for which we will get at least 100 different assays from each. So that we can spare for this crazy new DSP technique. And here's what we found, is that we take, um, here's an example of the uh, nanostring DSP masks. And so you can see the regions of interest that we're going to pick are melanoma, the green, CD68, the macrophages are the purple, and CD45 is red. So this is the only image you're going to see. Now after that, we're just going to see counts. It's interesting how well it, it, uh, the, the first technology that I showed you when I was doing uh, fluorescence was the aqua technology, and they're very parallel technologies. And what we found, in fact, is that it was PDL1 in the CD68 compartment, not PDL1 in the melanocyte compartment. Now, this is not lung cancer, which is what I just showed you. This is now melanoma, but the same result that the patients do better um, if they have high PDL1 in the CD68 region of interest compared to low PDL1 in the CD68 region of interest, uh, whereas PDL1 in the melanocyte region of interest really doesn't show the same result. So that's our first look. Now let's look back at that lung cancer cohort. So in the lung cancer cohort, we looked at 40 targets and, 40 independent com and four independent compartments. And you can see they don't all work. So the ones in red are targets that failed. So we're still in the early, early stages of this technology, but I think it's a really inner technology. And we can look in the cytokeratin compartment, that will be the cancer cells, CD45 compartment, all immune cells, and the CD68 compartment for macrophages and probably MDSCs. Um, and maybe some other cell types, dendritic cells. And then we can look in the rest of the stroma. But we can look with this whole list of tags and uh, using this same approach. So here's the, um, an example of a picture of the compartmentalization. And you can see how the compartmentalization works. And it works pretty well. But it, it's giving you all the cells together. So this is not a single technology, but it's a group of cells technology. And here's the the cohort that we used, I already showed this cohort, this is the lung cancer cohort, so I'll move through the next one. And look at some of the markers that we found that were interesting. So in the, uh, in the CD45 compartment, that's the compartment that is all lymphocytes, we found that CD56, CD4, and ARG1, all cut at, the, at uh, various cut points, were st associated with um, a benefit <coughs> from uh, immune therapy in these, in both a univariate analysis and a multivariate analysis. And so these are, it's kind of um, the beginning, and clearly this is not a, the end of the story. Um, we can try to validate it a little bit. You can see CD4 patients in the same cohort. Now this is um, look, looking at um, the survival curves, showing better outcome in the CD56 high patients. And in fact, we can then take that data and do regular quantitative immunofluorescence, now only fourplex with CD56, and you can see some CD56 positive cells here. And then you measure them, and the patients with high CD56 uh, in CK negative cells, so CK, some, some melanoma and some lung cancer express CD56, but if they're CK negative, that means they have to be um, a lymphocyte or a, a, some sort of leukocyte. And you can see that the high CD56 uh, cells do better than the patients with low CD56 BFS and OS. So, early work, but provocative and, and more importantly, I think, illustrative of the kinds of things that you can do with digital spatial profiling, which is a sort of a new high-plex technique. What we showed here was just a 44-plex, and even that was probably stretching the truth. It was probably closer to a 35-plex, since some of the molecules didn't work. But um, it, it, it leads to uh, provocative uh, suggestions that CD56 and CD4 maybe something worth pursuing in, in more detail as a quantitative approach to look for activation. Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about in the last five minutes or so is imaging mass cytometry. So imaging mass cytometry is a way of taking the antibodies and labeling with, with the heavy metal. And the heavy metals, unlike fluorescence, which overlap a lot, the heavy metals don't overlap in spectrum at all when you look at mass spec. So we can take these heavy metals and actually blow them off the, and put, connect the heavy metals to the antibodies, put them in the machine, blow them off with a laser in this machine here, run them down the time of flight tube, which is in this machine here, and then plot them out and, fig, and then map them back to where they were so that you can have essentially a, mul a high multiplex assessment using these different heavy metals. And I add this slide because the cancer center um, through the closer to free bike ride is how we got this machine in the first place. So thanks to the cancer center for providing that.
Here's what the images look like, and you can see it doesn't look quite as nice as an immunohistochemistry chemistry image because first of all, we're mapping it back, and then secondly, we're mapping it back to each one micron pixel. So remember the immunohistochemistry chemistry sort of at the limit of diffraction has about a 0.2 micron resolution. This technology has one micron resolution, and the DSP technology that I showed you has 10 micron resolution. So they're not competitive. You get to ans ask different questions with different tools. And so I think this is another tool that you can use. And you can see how sort of pixelated this appears uh, for various biomarkers that were in the mix. And in fact, um, oh, I didn't include that slide. It must have fallen out of the carousel. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the number of, of um, antibodies that we used in this was a 26-plex. So we had 26 different antibodies labeled with 26 different heavy metals. And, and what we did is then look, do that same thing, that is look at which of those uh, antibodies are associated with response to therapy uh, in the melanoma cohort, or in the, in the lung cancer cohort. In this case, it's actually the melanoma cohort. We'll tell you, talk about the lung cancer cohort next, or Kurt Schalper will tell you about that when you listen to him speak. Um, but what you can see is that HLA, ABC, and beta-2 microglobulin have the most, uh, the highest hazard ratios, or if you want to invert these, one over these is the protective level. Um, CD8, of course, we know is significant. That's the most significant one, and we've actually validated that and previously published that. But even some other things in the tumor compartment, CSF1R, like 3, HLA-DR, also interesting biomarkers to probe in the future. And then in the CD8 compartment, CSF1R, so perhaps regulating how it's, um, perhaps that some, some, someone will ask me or someone will say, well, isn't this just a surrogate for gamma interferon signaling? Maybe it is, but maybe that's what we need because PDL1, which is a surrogate for gamma interferon signaling as well, isn't a very good biomarker for predicting response to therapy, at least not by IHC. So here's how these biomarkers actually look. It's not quite as pretty. It's a binary thing. These, these aren't color. These are, it's a binary metal, heavy metal signature. And what we can find then is looking at survival curves of various techniques that, so here's all, these top four are all in tumor cells, HLA-DR, beta-2M, um, with uh, progression-free and overall survival, progression-free and overall survival, look very promising in the stromal compartment, uh, beta-2M looks fairly promising, and in the CD68 compartment, um, CD163 looks like a fairly promising biomarker. Again, discovering from the patient side back to the molecular side that I hope to partner with uh, some immunologists and actually come up with potential mechanisms for some of these findings. Because we have both toys, we can compare them. Here's imaging mass cytometry and digital spatial profiling, and you can see for some biomarkers like CD8 and CD4 and CD3, there's pretty good correlations, whereas some markers like T67, which is both in the tumor cell and in the immune cell, is confusing. It's confusing the technologies because they have different resolution, and so you see not such a great correlation, and similarly for granzyme B. So with that, um, these are kind of our overall uh, conclusions that uh, three potential predictors for IO response in melanoma are beta-2M, HLA, uh, ABC, and 163 in the CD168 compartment. And there's, there's good correlation with some but not all between IMC, QIF, quantitative fluorescence, and the DSP. And that I think these are powerful tools for biomarker discovery that I look forward to being able to come up with better biomarkers than pdl one IHC, which is where we started with respect to visualization. So before I end, I always want to thank the people that did all the work in the lab um, and former lab, lab members and Yale collaborators um, shown here, and um, also then just show a picture of my lab group uh, at our party. Thank you very much. Great, David. Um, I think you showed that, or were uh, suggesting that ARG1 also expression correlated with response in the CD68 compartment. Yes. I mean, it's it's interesting too because the the identification of myeloid subtypes in the tumor microenvironment has been a mess for quite a while between M1, M2, and MDSC. I think your data actually is probably the best data I've heard suggesting you know a suppressive role because of the PDL1 expression being important in the macrophage compartment. But from our mouse studies, we also find that um, ARG1 correlates very closely with PDL1 expression, and NOS2 or INOS is another marker that you know you might think about. We can talk about that another time. But uh, I think it's pretty exciting as 
you were saying too, as a proxy for, perhaps for um, local cytokine storm or interferon gamma expression in the tumor microenvironment. So I think the, the approach looks really great. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I think this is a, a great, um, um, many of you, or some of you might have been at uh, Marcus's grand rounds yesterday and saw some very similar results in a mouse model. So I'm, I'm anxious to try to compare and contrast what we're seeing in our patient cohorts versus the mouse model. Dude, that was um, amazing, actually. Um, and I can't wait to see these things start to replace single IHCs <laughs> in the path lab. Um, so I couldn't help but notice that uh, on one of your slides, PDL2 um, had uh, a high predictive value. Um, and so my question is you went um, you say stroma do you do you have more granularity as to which so cell types and how does it probably be in macrophages but um, I didn't I kind of glossed over that and, and you're sharp and picked it up we've actually have some PDL2 data bit. from mRNA um, but we're worried about the PDL2 data here because I'm not sure um, how specific the antibodies are PDL2 has has escaped the attention of a lot of investigators because so many of the antibodies don't validate. And it's not clear that this antibody is not cross reacting, which is the problem with many other PDL2 antibodies. They actually cross react with other species, including PDL1. And so this worries me a little bit that this isn't truly PDL2. And so I kind of skimmed by that. Because the p value is pretty good. Yeah, it is very good. <laughs> That was great. Uh, I'm wondering about uh, spatial localization uh, and taking this, you know, who's next to who. Have you, have you guys thought about how to possibly integrate that into these kinds of analyses? So, in, for example, distances? like, uh, yeah, distances between, between So we cells. have, and actually, um, uh, Fahad Ahmed, who may be in the audience, a postdoc in my lab, has spent a lot of time uh, determining the space, the distances between um, macrophages and T cells and T cells and tumor cells. And what we've found so far is nothing. Um, it turns out that it's, it, the T cells ha are important, but they don't, they don't fractionate into different spaces. And when they get far enough away, then they're not important. But any, there's, it's a broad range of distances, and finding them close to tumor cells, for example, or close to macrophages is no, no better a prognostic marker or predictive marker than finding them far to a certain distance, which is sort of the distance we can measure out to about 50 uh, microns or so, 40 or 50 microns. That's really interesting. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much.